to John chapter 4, verse 17. I was sitting down to study out a little bit, pray, prepare. And this email came in. And it's so awesome to me how God works with his Holy Spirit. So the Lord has been putting on our hearts this message. It's been burning and it's been coming out in different ways. Um, for Pastor, what started to burn in him and even in Miss Regina um, when she was away, not even knowing that Pastor Colby was preaching this message, Regina was preaching this message was it the same day? Yeah, but was it on the same day? Might have been on the same day or same week. And we knew she was traveling and she was ministering and she preached this message down in, where were you? Tulsa? Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we didn't get to hear her message. We didn't know what she was preaching on. But then the next Sunday or that Sunday, I can't remember which one, Pastor Colby was preaching basically the same message. She heard the words, run your race. And then Pastor Colby, unbeknownst to us, he was preaching on running your race. And then myself, I heard it in a different light, but it's the same message. It's like God is calling his body right now, his church, his people, his youth, you, right? to run your race or another, uh, what burned in my heart was I just kept feeling like, God, there's, there is more, there's this adventure. And I felt like he was saying, I called you to be on this adventure with me. And the words that kept coming to me was they that know their God will do mighty exploits, which is still running your race, right? Can you see it? So it's about your calling, what you're called to do, your purpose. Tonight is a different piece of that, but um, I just, I can't get off of the message, and I open up my email today, and it wouldn't, you know, and these are all these different ministers. They don't talk to us. I don't think, and some of these really big ones, I don't think they're watching our YouTube videos. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't believe that they're following me on Instagram or whatever, wherever I'm posting, but yet they're, all of a sudden they pop up and they're preaching a message on it and somebody else is popping up and they're preaching a message on it. That's the spirit of God speaking to his body throughout the whole world. Isn't that amazing? So I got this email because I'm signed up for uh, a ministry that I like to listen to. She doesn't know me directly um, at all. She's just, she sends out a mass email to all the people that are signed up to receive her emails, right? And her name is Terry Savelle, and Foy is her married name. And she says, what are you doing with your dash? <laughs> she says, okay, let me explain. And what I'm about to say may seem a little morbid, but I hope this wakes you up like it did me. It says, when you die, there will be a tombstone with your full name on it. Your birth date will be on the left side and the date that you died on will be on the right side. But it's that little dash in the middle that represents what you did with your life. That dash will be a symbol of whether you lived out your God-given dreams and purpose or whether you allowed the enemy to stop you from stepping into your destiny. One of my favorite verses of scripture is John 17 verse 4. I got it backwards. I told you to turn to John 4, 17. Turn to John 17. We're going to look at verse 4. She reads this in the message translation first. I'm going to read it to you in the Amplified Classic in a second. It says, this is Jesus talking. And Jesus says this. 
he's talking to the Lord. He is praying to the Father, and he said, I glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. By completing down to the last detail what you assigned me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with your very own splendor, the very splendor I had in your presence before there was a world. So this is Jesus praying to the Father just before he goes to the cross, okay? And he's saying this, this statement, and then the Amplified Classic, it says, I have glorified you down here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. It sounds like I ran my race. I fought the fight, right? And I finished strong, right? Now, some of you are, I mean, men, all of you, all of you are young. Your race is really just beginning. However, because of what the Lord is saying in the earth right now, it's not time to lay back and wait. It's time to, even at your age, run your race, right? Right? And so tonight, I, I thought more about what she said in her, in her email, but that little dash, that's such an important piece to your life, that, that time you spent in between. And I, I want to tell you something. You don't have time to waste your life. It's precious. Every single day you live is a day recorded in history that can never be relived. Every single day you live is a day recorded in history that can never be relived. You're never going to get that day back, right? And I was thinking about, and what's coming to me even now, and this is a, that was a quote from Terry out of her email as I finish up that part. But I think about when I was your age, and when I was 14, my stepmom, and an amazing woman, like she was a real mom. She was beautiful and she listened and she, I mean, she had all this life going. And at 38 years old, she went to uh, the doctor to have a surgery done. And um, she ended up having the surgery and I, I shared that a little bit with you last time. Like, she had a check about it, right? She didn't believe she should have the surgery with this doctor, but she felt pressure. She felt obligated because she used to work for him. So she goes in, and she has the surgery, and the doctor makes a mistake, and um, it's called malpractice, and, and she dies. And at 15 years or 14 years old, I looked back at those days where I had gotten angry. I had said things I didn't mean. I also looked back at the really wonderful days and wish I had more of them. And none of those days I could get back. None of them. And there was a lot of teenager regret in those days and you're going to have that you're going to have moments like your frontal lobe is still developing you wish you would have said it differently you wish you would have responded differently any of you have those days anybody us adults have those days now but I think about the race that I was running up until that point and even though I have my whole life out ahead of me there's still markers where I wish I would have lived it different right I wished I would have said some things differently. I wish I would have had moments to tell her in a different way. I wish I wouldn't have gotten so angry about the attention she was giving my dad or my dad was giving her. I wish I wouldn't have been a, an emotional teenager in certain moments. I still had regrets, right? Things that I couldn't get back, I couldn't relive it. So as you're hearing me tonight, I want you to hear me from a place of a young person that goes, you know what, even, even now I could have a moment where I've wasted this day, right? I wasted this opportunity. I remember thinking about um, the, the Christmas that I had with my brother who, who is um, my, my stepbrother technically, who is serving 
uh, two life sentences in prison, and, and many of you know that and how important he is to me and how much I love him, and I wish that I had him in my world right now in the free world, you know? And I think about one of the Christmases where I got so upset and I threw a fit. Man, I had an emotional reaction as a teenager. Anybody do that? None of y'all pout, pout, do you? You give your family the silent treatment? You don't do that, right? Not any of you angels. I pouted. I got upset at Christmas because something, I don't know what happened. I wish I could tell you what happened because I'd love to tell you the detail of how stupid it was. <laughs> but somebody set me off. They hurt my feelings in my family. And I marched off. I remember marched loudly to my bedroom. We lived in a trailer. So when you march in a trailer, it's real loud, kind of like this. Because the floor is hollow. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> and I slammed my door and they all begged me to come back out. Come on, it's my siblings. Sissy, come out. We didn't mean it. You know, all those kind of things. And I'm like, no. I'm going to make them all pay by not having my presence with them. And I could hear them in the living room laughing and carrying on and finishing out Christmas. And I remember getting to the end of that day and being so mad at myself. Why did I do that? Like, because Christmas really stands out to you because you only have so many of those in a, in a, in a lifetime, right? You only have, I'm going to be 18 and I'm going to only have so many Christmases with my family. I had no idea that I was only going to have, that would be one of the very few Christmases that I got to have with my brother. I think about those things sometimes. I don't look at them and, and dwell there. I don't let it make me feel like, I don't let it hold me there and, and cause a lifetime of shame, but I let it remind me. If you know me long enough, even if you're barely an acquaintance with me, but I really care about you, I say I love you a lot. When you leave my presence, when I'm hanging up the phone, I say, bye, I love you. If I'm getting out of the car and somebody's going into the building and, and they might think that's weird, maybe they don't. I have no idea, but I say I love you a lot, right? Because I think about my mom that died. I think about never being able to say it. So I want to let everybody know within my presence how much they mean to me when they're with me in the moment for the rest of my life because that's how I'm going to live is I'm going to let you know what you mean to me every time we say goodbye because I don't know if it's the last time. I'm not promised tomorrow right? I'm always aware of my actions in a different light. And, and I don't let it beat me up and condemn me. Some of you, some of you guys that are worriers, I don't want you to add this to your weight. I want, I want you to get free tonight, but I want to help the ones that need to think like this, to think like this, right? Tell people what they mean to you. And so I decided that's going to be something I add to myself as I run my race in my life. These are going to be decisions that I make. I'm going to make sure that I don't waste another day pouting and wallowing in self-pity, feeling bad for myself. I'm just telling you practical things right now, helping you relate. Because time is too short. My brother was serving two life sentences by the time... Well, when I turned 18. That's, that's your race right now, right? You can't go back and relive those Christmases or those moments. So you need to make every moment, you need to decide, I'm going to make every moment count. Am I going to do it perfectly? No. Are you going to have moments? Yes, 100%. And you're a teenager. You're going to have those moments where you wish you could take what you said back. And you're going to have to show yourself a little bit of mercy. But right now, in this moment, I just want you to determine in your heart, I'm going to make every moment count. See, you're perfectly designed with a purpose and a calling, right? And in this purpose and in this calling, we need to decide we're going to make every moment moment count. 
And let me tell you something really cool. You're so perfectly designed for your purpose and your calling that everything about you is designed for that. So you have certain interests, things you like, right? Things you're interested in. How many of you like band? How many of you like to play an instrument of any kind? How many of you kind of are really interested in playing an instrument? I'm going to write notes here. Where are you at? Put your hands up high. How many of you guys love to write? You love to read. You like the written word, right? Like on, there's this movie, Never Been Kissed, and she's like, words are my life. <laughs> She's a, she's a writer. She writes articles. How many of you guys like science and health and the way the human anatomy works or how, how uh, science outside of that, like explosions and inertia or all those types of things, interests? How many of you guys realize that even your stature is, is about, I'm, I'm a full-on believer, even your stature, uh, not just your, your inside, but your external is, I think God picked it out for your purpose also, right? I think God made you the height you are because you're called to a purpose. Does that sound crazy? I think that God gave you the sense of humor that you had because he's called you for a specific purpose. I think that God gave you, right even down to, to your, 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 uh, your interest in, in style or how you choose to present yourself, that's going to be maybe seem superficial to some, but I think that's because it's, it's, it's designed for your purpose. As I, as I think about how to help you discern and understand and know what you're called to do and how to find God's will for your life. I just want you to sit down right now and I'm going to have just a talk with you one-on-one -on -one about let's take a look at some simple things that will help you determine your purpose, right? So tonight, it's all about this race that you're running. It's all about decisions that you need to make because this is, there's this adventure you're called to be on, right? So take an assessment of things you're interested in. Write them down. Make a list. Make a list of things that you're passionate about. Maybe make a list of things that make you so mad you want to do something about it. Things that irritate you. Make a list of things that irritate you. You're like, what? How can that be a part of my purpose? Well, let's just say that you're a person who cannot stand it when um, little children in school are put into a group with kids that read slow and everybody can see it up on the walls, right? Like in your classroom, there's like the speed readers, the kids that are in state, like the first level, right? And everybody can look up on that wall and it just makes you so mad because those kids are going to be singled out as the slow readers. And then everybody's going to know they're a slow reader. And that kid's going to be staring that they're a slow reader all the time. And they're going to receive that as their identity. And they're going to, you know what I mean? Let's just say, I don't know why, but that just bugs me so bad. Right? And there's just something where it stirs you up and it makes you mad when the teacher does it. I'm just giving you an example. And you're like, want to rip those stinking fish off the wall with the names on it so nobody can tell who's a slow reader in the classroom. Maybe you're called. Maybe you're called to help in an area that would put an end to that or help young kids with their identity in those areas of schooling. Do you see what I'm saying? Pay attention to the things that you're passionate about or the things that really get you worked up. That might help lead you into what you're called to do, right? But I'm going to start with the very, very beginning because I know there's so many new ones here and there's super young ones in the room that just came up from, from fifth grade into sixth grade. And so I'm going to start at a beginning, but for some of you, I'm going to give you a reminder that you might need to hear. So step one into determining and helping 
and, and, and realizing and running this race and, and entering into the purpose or the call that God has for you, that was all kind of just an introduction, <laughs> is number one is you have to pick up the call. You have to pick up the call. One of my friends in ministry posted this meme this week, and it is so great. I had Colby find it for me or put it up on the screen. Can you put up that photo? Maybe. <laughs> it says, my brain literally stops working when this happens. Does anybody, anybody have that kind of a phone? And when you're like, I don't know what to do. Which one is what? And accept? Like, that. whoever made that was like, a, uh, wanted to just mess with people's minds, right? Why can't you just have green, red, right? I mean, this is, and accept, decline, hold accept. You're like, what? Anybody? Anybody? I do that too. I was like, yes. <laughs> When that comes in like that, you're like, oh, and then a second call, and it's like merge calls. Anybody accidentally merged a call? You have to decide uh, to answer the call, to pick it up. And, and in everybody's race, in everybody's purpose, in everybody's calling, first things are first, and this is the first one for everybody. This one is for everyone. So I felt like we should talk about the one that's for everyone, right? Right? Jesus, the very first thing he does is he says to you, follow me. If you study Matthew, the book of Matthew in the Bible, Mark, the book of Mark, Luke, and John, and you read about the life of Jesus, when he went to every single person, the first thing he said was, follow me right? We read about, we talked about Matthew, right? The tax collector last week. And what did he say? He said, follow me. In one translation, it said, join my party. I think that means join my cause, right? Follow me. Now, when you, when you look at Matthew or, or Peter, right? We're going to look at Peter in a, in a second. When you look at these guys, Jesus said, follow me. And, and, um, I didn't hear and argue back <laughs> when I read it. I, I, I watched what they did. Let's watch what, let's, let's look it up for a second. Let's look what, I believe it's Peter. Look at Matthew chapter four, verse 19. Matthew chapter four, verse 19. Okay. Okay. So if you look at 19, it says, well, let's look at 18. It said, as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he noticed two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, so Peter, and Andrew, his brother, throwing a dragnet into the sea, for they were fishermen. So they had a big fishing net, okay? And they're throwing it into a sea, the Sea of Galilee, okay? And he said to them, come after me as my disciples, letting me be your guide. That's a huge word right there, guide. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He said to them in the King James Version says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now here's an important part, next verse. It says, at once. Say at once. Does that word make you think they stalled? They said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me go back to my house real quick. They, they at once, they left their nets. They left their nets. Now, um, became his disciples and sided with his party and followed him. And going on further from there, he noticed two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets and putting them right. And he called them. 
At once they left the boat and their father and joined Jesus as disciples. And there again, at once. Say, at once. No, no, say it. At once. They sided with his party and followed him. And he went all about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every weakness and infirmity among the people. So the report of him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all who were sick, those afflicted with various diseases and torments, those under the power of demons and epileptics and paralyzed people, and he healed them. And great crowds joined and accompanied him about coming from Galilee and Diapolis and the district of the ten cities east of the Sea of Galilee and Jerusalem and Judea and from other east side of the Jordan. That sounds like one decisive decision after another, right? I'm going to follow him. The guys on the boat with their dad They literally didn't say, but we have to help our dad. Wait, Jesus, can you hold up? I need to go find a replacement for myself real quick because they need to help my father, right? I mean, that's what I would do. I'm like the worrier kid usually, or I was. I'm not anymore in Jesus' name. But I'm like, I got to make sure everybody's okay. Is anybody like that? I got to make sure the whole house is okay before I like... And, and when you become a mom, you, you even get worse like that. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're having the Holy Spirit's constantly having to say, you're not everybody's Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> Sometimes he has to tell me that with pastoring too. So at once they all followed him. At once they answered the call. You don't see this kickback, but you also don't see this like, where are we going? I'll follow you if you're going someplace really cool. <laughs> Uh, what are we going to do when we get there? When, when Jesus calls you, you don't just stop and go, okay, well, what is my calling, Jesus? Because then I'll know where to go, right? If, if you tell me my calling right now, I'm going to know where to go, right? Peter didn't stop and say, wait, hold up, hold up. Where are we going, right? I just want to know. And, and then what am I going to do when I get there? What do you have for me, right? There was none of that, none of that. We, we kind of mess things up when we sit there and go, well, okay, if, if God tells me what I'm supposed to do, then, then I'll know which way to go, right? If God tells me that I'm, and I'm, I'm not, I've, there's very few instructions like that in the word. Actually, I don't know of one, except for maybe Joseph, because Joseph had this dream of everybody bowing to him and him being in a high position, right? That was pretty like end goal, end goal, right? Where you're going, Joseph, that's your calling. And God gave him a dream. But his situation in the Bible was very rare. Very rare. I don't, actually, I don't know if I could think of another one like that one, right? Maybe David, because when David was out tending sheep, he's like strumming his harp, right? And I don't know how old he was when he got anointed. I would have to go look that up. I know that when he fought Goliath, he was between the ages of 12 to 15, but he'd already been anointed to be king. So maybe he was like eight, who knows? And so he's standing there and he gets anointed and that is the symbol that I'm going to be king, right? So David knew his purpose early, but for the most part, there's not going to be a moment where Jesus says, hey, Follow me because I'm going to call you to be my treasurer, right? And you're going to track the money and you're going to do all those things, right? I'm sorry. I don't mean to use Judas while I'm looking at you. Like nobody wants to be Judas. But I mean, in that moment with those particular disciples, he didn't call them and say, this is what we'll be doing. He just said, follow me. And they said, yes. So, You cannot follow him until you pick up the call. You have to answer it. You have to sit, push the green button, right? And take the call. In in my world, I get lots of phone calls. In fact, I'd rather I'd I'd rather not answer the phone 
because first of all, I have lots of things going on and, and that's going to stop me from where I'm going because I have to stop and pick up this phone call. And I've gotten so good at ignoring the calls on my phone. Terry, I was relating to Terry Savelle when she was saying this in her, her note. She said, I don't even notice when it's ringing anymore. I was like, that is so true. How many of you guys, well, I guess I should ask. Well, Stacy would be like laughing right now because she knows, she calls me the most probably with youth leadership stuff and everything. And ask my son, how good am I at answering my phone? <laughs> and I was relating. I was like, yes, because I'm, first of all, I hate my phone. So I'd like to forget it and I lose it all the time. It's in other rooms. I had somebody tell me yesterday, you need to get a watch so that you can ping your phone. And I thought, that's a great idea. And then I immediately thought, no, because then I'm chained. My, phone, my wrist is going to be buzzing 24-7. I'm going to not be able, I'm going to literally give myself a brain scramble because I'm going to try to focus on my phone's, my wrist is going to be like dinging five million times, right? So I'm actually trying to lose the phone. But I, 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 you, can't, you can get to the point where you ignore it so much you don't even know it's ringing anymore. You can ignore the call of God. He's been dialing you up for so long that you don't even feel it anymore. You don't even recognize it anymore. You can get to a place, and this is most adults, so I hope they watch this video, which I hate posting these videos, but I hope they watch this part because you could have pushed that aside so much that you didn't answer that call, and then you don't even feel the call anymore. You don't even know what you're called to do. Your friends are standing by watching you, watching your gifts and, and going, are you going to do anything with that? You don't even know what your gifts are anymore. Did you know you can get to that point? Some of you are so young, you're like, I want to know what my gifts are. There's some adults that have been sitting on their gifts, doing nothing with them, my age and older, and you can, I, I can guarantee you that they don't even know what their gifts are anymore. They've been going through motions for so long. They've ignored that little buzzer on the inside, that dialing them up, that ringing, and Jesus is calling, right? And they're not picking up. And so they don't even know what their gifts are anymore. They once did. I, w I used to be really good at this, or I used to be really good at that, but I've kind of lost it. And, and other people standing back can look at them. As a pastor, I see things. The Lord shows me things on people. I don't remember which one of you it was. You were writing a, a, a paper on, on people's jobs and, and you wanted to interview me. Can't remember who that was. And you said, what is the hardest thing about your job? And at that time in my season, I was like, man, betrayal. That was hard. Pouring into somebody and then being wounded. And I was, I was not in a good place at that time. Like just my heart was hurting. I wasn't in a bad place. I wasn't in sin. And, and I said, that's really hard. But I take it back now because I'm totally, the Lord walked me through that season. He healed my heart. And I thought, no. Do you want to know what's the hardest thing? Is seeing what's on the inside of people. Seeing that God, I can, I can tell when somebody's like got something from God and they are anointed for it. I can't always tell exactly what they're called to do. It's not like the Lord says, sometimes he shows me things, but I can literally see or feel or know, man, this person is called to do something great. And I can even see it in the way that, let's say, the way they communicate and the way that people are drawn to them. And I can see what, what we would call the anointing on their life. And then I can see them do nothing with it. They don't, they don't do anything with it. And by what I mean, what, what they don't do with it is they, they don't invest in that. They're too preoccupied with busyness. That they don't take the time to grow in, in the things that will cultivate that. They don't go sit underneath the teaching of the word and feed that so that that ability grows. They don't take the time to come to church or to Bible study or to invest in that. They're kind of sitting in the grandstands. They're not down on the racetrack. They're watching. They're spectators. And it's so hard to see that gifting on someone's life and to want it more than they do. To want to want what God has for you more than you do is really hard. 
to go, man, they have so much talent. They have so much ability. They, like, if they only knew what the, I can see, the champion on the inside of them, and, 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 and you can only say that to them so much. You, you can only say that to them so much. You can only get on the phone and say, hey, I missed you. I missed you at youth last night. Or, hey, we're doing this. Or, hey, um, we're going to camp, right? And these places where you're going to be able to get into the presence of God and feed that on the inside and, and hear from him for yourself and, and cultivate that and feed that gift and feed that ability on the inside of you until it just comes out. I mean, so many people are like, I want to know what I'm called to do so I can take step one, step two, step three, step... And, and, and really, this is how it's done. The Bible says that a man's gift will make room for him. It's just going to come out. But you can't have it come out if you are sitting in the stands of life and you're spectating, right? Your zone, like, I'm going to give you teenager world, but even adults do this. Man, they're just sitting there going through, like, I've, I keep repeating this, and I don't want to be on repeat in your mind, but they're watching they're watching everybody else really live on their phones. They're, they're watching the screens. They're watching, they're, they're going through motions at their jobs just to get a paycheck so they can buy the vacation that they want to take their family on. But every day is supposed to be a vacation adventure of a lifetime. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's easy. It just means that it's an adventure. I mean... Raising children is an adventure. Sometimes it's a lot of work, but every day if I stop and I, and I enjoy my kid and I, I see the new thing that they're doing or their new ability, I sat back last night and I heard one of them strumming on the guitar upstairs and I, it melted me. I thought, gosh, I could sit there and listen to my child tinker around all night on the, the guitar. That's not boring or... Do you see what I'm saying? Raising kids is hard, but you have these moments in every day. I'm just giving you mom's version. Your version is different. You have to, you have to determine right now you're going to make every second count, and you're going to enjoy every moment of it. But you have to answer that call first. Every disciple ample answered that simple request. Will you follow me? Nothing more, nothing less. I just want to tell you, this is what answering looks like. Every single one of them, my mic's going out. Check, check. Every single one of those disciples laid something down. To answer that call, you're going to have to lay something down. They, they, they laid down their net. I mean, Matthew laid down collecting taxes, right? They, they had to walk away from something they were doing, currently doing. I'm going to make it super simple, but they laid something down. It always, answering that call always will require surrender. So if you turn to Romans chapter 12, I turn to this a lot for young people, but I should turn to this a lot for old people too. It says... I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. That's a surrender, isn't it? That's like, hey, all of me, you have it all. You know, you sing that song, you can have it all, Lord. You can have it all, Lord, right? Every bit of my heart, right? Now, my question is, because so many of you are like, I'm in, I'm in. Did you fully answer? I mean, this is only for you. Did you fully answer? Did you, but did you, or did you leave some, doors in your heart closed. Like, Lord, you can have this section and you can have this section, but this part, I kind of like doing this, right? Whatever it is. He's going to, I mean, there's going to be a laying down of something. 
And it is not any different today. It still looks like that. It looks like just like it did when he first mentioned it to those disciples. It says, do not be conformed to this world. I'm in verse two. This age or fashioned and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes so that you may prove yourselves what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Now, don't get lost in all of these words. It's showing you that you may prove what is the will of God for you. So in this beautiful portion of scripture, you actually have in the instructions right there in your fingertips of how to find God's will for your life. First, answer the call. Surrender. Present your body and all that you are to God and say, I'm yours. And you do this every morning. Every morning, I give you my heart. I give you my mind. Lord, I ask you to direct my path today. I surrender to your will and to your way, right? I'm presenting myself as a living sacrifice. I'm laying down what I want for what you want. And I promise you, he's not going to give you anything that you'll hate. You're going to love it. You were made for it. It's when you force yourself to do something you you weren't made for, you're going to be miserable. But if you go, God, I give you my whole life, my whole world today, this morning, I'm going to give you it all. That's a living sacrifice, right? So you do that every day. I'm helping you, right? And then it says, do not be conformed to this world Fashioned after, adapted to its external superficial customs. Do you understand what that means? It means do not do what the world does to get what they have. If all the fish are going one direction, you need to go the other direction, right? (laughs) If everybody is staring at their cell phones, you put yours down, right? I'm just giving you some simple stuff. If everyone is spending their time doing these certain things, but you have a unique gift and a unique call that is unique to you, you can't be doing what everybody else is doing. Check. Ooh, I had a wrap on that. You can't be doing what everybody else is doing. It's your call. It's your purpose. It's you separating yourself, presenting your, yourself unto God as a living sacrifice. And then it says, don't look like them. Don't do what they do to get what they have. It says, but be transformed by the entire renewal of your mind. That's the thing between your ears, the way that you think. And the only way to renew that is with the, wi- with the word of God. This, going in your mind and studying it out and meditating it and making it your own, right? That's like, I'll give you an example. Hmm. So the world studies and studies and studies and studies to get smart, right? And I'm not saying studying is bad. You should study. You should study things that you're interested in. You should study. It grows your brain, Right? But I'm saying to get smart, for them to be smart people, knowledge does not make you a smart person. Do you understand that? A smart person is somebody that can apply that knowledge. That's called wisdom. I can have, I can know all facts. I can tell you facts galore, right? But does that make me smart? It's what I do with what I know that makes me smart, right? But the world says you have to study and study and study to get smart. And so everybody sits back and goes, well, I don't have good grades, so I'm not smart. That's a pattern of this world. Do you want to know how I got smart? Super smart. I decided that the one who's smarter than me lives on the inside of me. And he knows all things, because the Bible said he knows all things. And it says he lives inside of me. So I decided to talk to the Holy Spirit to answer questions I don't know. Well, I don't know the answer to that, Lord, but you do, right? 
And then my Bible says that I have been given the mind of Christ. How smart is Jesus, the creator of everything? How smart is Jesus? Very smart. And the Bible says that I have his mind. I've been given the mind of Christ. I'm making it simple. I'm laying it out for you. Don't lose it. You ready? So I've decided to be smart. I'm going to speak that over my life. I have the mind of Christ. I know all things because the greater one lives on the inside of me, right? Do you want to know how much smarter I am in my day? How, how much faster I respond just by deciding to absorb that, receive that truth into my mind, right? So the word of God can transform your mind. So answering the call also looks like this. I'm going to give you super simple things. To answer that call, you have to start with little yeses. Answering the call starts with when he's ringing you up, he's dialing you up, and he's saying, follow me. Following him looks like this, little yeses every day. Little bitty yeses. To anything he's asking you to do, little yeses. Say little yeses to when he says, hey, take out the garbage. Say yes, go do it. If he's asking you to, hey, don't go out with your friends tonight. Hang out with your little sister who's been hurting and she has no friends. Take her to, take her to dinner and a movie. That's a yes. Start with those little dialing you up yeses to surrender your life, to lay down what you want and say yes to whatever it is, that little yes in that little moment. Say yes to all of them. When he says, hey, call this friend, Say yes. When he says, hey, send this friend that scripture, say yes. When you're standing at the grocery store checkout and he says, ask them how they're doing, say yes. Don't even give your brain time to think about it. Because your brain will talk you out of it. Why? Because your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak, the Bible says. Your flesh doesn't want to say yes to that. That's awkward. I'm going to be embarrassed. No, just say yes so fast your flesh can't think about it. Does that make sense? Don't let your mind think about it. Say yes. Just do it in the moment. Now, don't do that with everything. I'm telling you, if because teenagers need help understanding which yes. But when you know that's God, because the devil wouldn't ask me to ask a person how they're doing today, just say yes and do it. Get it out your mouth before you even have time to think about it. Pretend you're a three-year-old. They like to say things, and they don't even think about it. In that moment, right, just say yes. Start with little yeses. That's answering the call every single day. These are steps to find out what you're purposed to do. But it starts with saying, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow your leading. I'm going to answer the call, right? Those disciples, they had Jesus standing in front of them. So it was super easy because they're like, all right. They dropped their net. They started walking on the path with Jesus. Super easy. I can see him. He's right there. We're on this road. We don't know where we're going, but we're following him, right? Right? Then they see him do some pretty amazing things. And they're like, wow. And Jesus says, I, you, greater things will you do than even I do. Whoa. Right? So they're following him. They're watching what he does. So... Your little yeses are following him. Say yes to the little things. Say yes to prayer in your morning. Say yes to church on Sunday and Wednesdays. Say yes to Bible studies. Say yes to worship nights. Those are sacrifices. There's going to be opportunities. Your friends are going out on Friday night, but there's a worship night. Say yes. Say yes to the thing that's going to speak to your call. Say yes to the thing that's going to stir up on the inside of you and put you in a position to where you hear him best. If it's putting worship on in your car, instead of turning off the trash in this world, that's only going to tempt you to act like what they're doing, right? It's saying no to that new awesome song that everybody's listening to because when you get done listening to it, you feel like partying instead of being with Jesus, Instead of looking like him, it's saying no to that and yes to that. I'm going to put on worship. I'm going to shut this off. I'm going to clear my playlist. I'm going to do whatever. Say yes to that. It's say yes to the things that cause you to see and hear him clearly. You're trying to find your purpose. Tune in. 
right? Say yes to that. I was having a great conversation with one of you and they were saying, I want to learn, you, you should teach on that. And I, I chuckled. I thought, oh yeah, you've been gone. <laughs> I teach on how to hear the voice of God a lot to you. But I constantly teach on it. I constantly, because you need to know how to hear him. Your yes to the wrong thing could end your life prematurely. That's straight facts. There's a young girl, um, three girls, they were in a car. I'm going to ask Regina to help me with this story. Wait, no, four girls? Four friends, they had tickets to the Super Bowl. Like, physically go to the Super Bowl. Now, I don't think that's really exciting because I don't want to sit in a giant stadium with screaming crowds. And, but an, a legit Super Bowl might be super exciting. How many of y'all would be pretty excited with tickets to the Super Bowl? Christian girl, awesome Christian friends. I'm not saying she shouldn't say yes to friends, right? She, this is a true story. She all of a sudden got this check. I'll call it a check in her heart. It's kind of like a red light, green light. You want to know how to hear the voice of God? He's not going to be like, Derek, thou must stay home tonight and read. You know what I'm saying? It's not going to sound like that. The spirit of God lives on the inside of you. His spirit speaks to your spirit and your spirit translates it and brings it to your conscious mind. Okay, so you might have thoughts that are God, but the enemy shoots you with fiery darts, which are also thoughts, right? And then you have your own thoughts, your mind, your own will, your own emotions, right? You, I don't feel like it tonight, right? So these girls, this, this girl, I believe she just had a, a check and it was like a red light, don't go. And she had spent enough time listening to God that she knew that check was a don't go. And she told her friends, I don't know why, but I, I believe that God doesn't want me to go tonight. She didn't hear the words, don't go to the Super Bowl tonight. She felt like red light, don't go. And the friends are like, it's going to be so much fun. We will make sure that we're, you know, safe. And, and, and they're trying to sell her on it. And they're so excited to go. And she's like, I'm so sorry. I don't know why. I just, I feel like God is telling me, don't go. So she didn't go. Now, that's a, that seems like a little yes. And to her, it could have been a bigger yes. Let's say this is like, this kind of a big deal, right? Are you, when are you going to ever get to go to another actual Super Bowl? So she said yes to God, and she said no to the game. And her friends went to the game, and they were snapping her all kinds of fun pictures, and she's like, man, I'm not there. <laughs> and, and then the game's going on, and she's like, man, did I miss it? They're having so much fun and so exciting, and, you know, they're not trying to rub it in her face or anything. She's just like their good friend. And then the next thing is she sees it on their, what is that thing on your Snapchat that's like, is it your story? All right. And they put it on. If any of you are on my Snapchat, Gideon stole my phone and he named himself Gideon Johnson. So if you see his stuff, like he, he posts a picture of me eating noodles. How many of y'all are on that Snapchat and saw that? I was like, ah, there's, there's people that saw that. I didn't know that was up there. Who told me? Colby, did you tell me? Gideon has you on the. Would you girls not be mortified if somebody took random pictures of you and posted of you eating? I about died. I mean, like internally, like cried. Sorry. Squirrel. So these girls are listening to their friend and, and, and she's seeing all their stories and it sounds so exciting and she didn't go. She could have been tempted to go, maybe I miss God. I don't know what her feelings were in that moment, but it's what happened afterwards that made everything so crystal clear. These girls were coming home and, an, and a semi-truck hit them and all three of them died. Everyone in the car. And I have a question. I, I, I just, I have a question. Did the other three girls have a don't go, but they overrode it? Or, or did they have, these, these are questions that I asked, like did they have a moment where they said, maybe my friend's right? And if they would have taken it and paused, 
It's another thing. Tiny yeses and pauses are good things in your walk with the Lord. Pause, because if it's God today, it's God tomorrow. So I'm going to take this and wait on it and bring it to God and say, Lord, would you like, do you want me to not go? Right? Or maybe these girls didn't even know how to read a check. Right? Maybe, maybe they went to, this girl was taught by her parents how to pay attention to that inward, the Bible calls it an inward witness. Right? Turn to, turn to Romans chapter 8. When God is speaking to you about anything, directing your life in any way, he does it through his Holy Spirit. And he does it through down on the inside of you. And if you look at Romans, it's kind of super clear there. Chapter 8, verse 14. Well, actually, go to verse 13. This is so good. Uh, no, go to verse 11. I'm sorry. Kidding. It says, and if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that means he lives in you, he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore to life your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies through his spirit who lives in you. So we're talking about the spirit of God who lives in you. Say the spirit of God lives in me. So then brethren, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. That means to our nature, our, our skin nature, our flesh nature, what our bodies want to do, what our minds want to do. We're obligated to our, or obligated to our carnal nature. That's your natural flesh to live a life ruled by its standards set up by the dictates of the flesh that means we don't let our bodies tell us what to do for if you live according to the flesh you will surely die do you see that if you live according to the flesh you will surely die but if through the power of the holy spirit you are habitually putting to death or making that, that sounds like sacrificing, laying down your life, right? Putting to death, making extinct, deadening, evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really genuinely live forever. So that means you're supposed to be kicking your own butt. Does that make sense? I said this at the ladies' night, and they, I was like, I was like, sorry, I talked to teenagers, I, I, and, and I, I relate better. That means I kick my own butt. I don't let my body just do what it wants to do. Does that make sense? I want to hang out with my friends and go do something um, not good for me. Like, uh, it's going to get me in trouble. I know it, so I say no, right? But my body and my mind are like, oh, it's going to be so fun, right? But my, so I'm warring on the inside, and I say yes to the Spirit of God, a little yes. I don't say yes to what my body wants to do. Does it make sense? I'm buffeting it. That's what Paul says. I kick my own butt. That's basically what he does, right? If you want to go to the gym and you want to get muscular or you want to lose weight, you actually have to go to the gym, right? And then when you go there, you actually have to work the machines. Does your body want to do that? Anybody? Anybody? Just, I would like to see the, the mutants in the room. Anybody, their body wants to do that? Like you are so excited to pump that iron. <laughs> there are some of you. I'm not excited. I know my child. He's like, Mom, can I go work out? Mom, can I go work out? It's like 11 at night. Can I go work out? I'm like, no. I'm wanting to crash and go to bed. And he's like, his body is saying, let's go pump iron. And I'm like, uh-uh, that's painful. I don't want to do it. Right? I know it's good for me. I know I want the result. I want to look like the, the, the person in the magazine that lifts all the weights. But... I don't want to do what it took to get there. I want to be the super Christian led by the spirit of God, always hearing the voice of God, but I don't want to do what it took to get there. You cannot continuously say yes to your body and what it wants. You have to say no and give God little yeses. Give him little yeses all day long. It's not hard. I'm not asking you to turn into Titanic in one swipe. I'm saying start with little yeses. 
Yes, I'm not going to listen to that song. Yes, I'm not going to go with that friend. I'm not going to do what my body wants to do because it's death after that. It says, for all, say all, who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For the spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, the spirit producing sonship in the bliss of which we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. Can you throw up that whole section in the Passion Translation? Verse 14, and you, wait, okay, wait, 14, 14. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Do you see it? This is how you hear the voice of God. This is how you avoid the semi in your life. The mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. It's like a nudge on the inside. It's like a, a nudge of God, right? He's like, Psst, hey, scoot over. <laughs> or, hey, don't go with those friends tonight. You have to avoid him. You have to answer those little yeses so that we, you'll recognize the big ones for your purpose. Does that make sense? I said yes to that calling that friend. Are you hearing me? I said yes to calling that friend. And they go, man, thank you for calling me. I really needed to talk to somebody. And you go, yeah, I heard God. And then you, you felt that little nudge on the inside. It was like a ding, right? Ding, Jesus calling, ding, right? And you're like, okay, I'm going to answer that. I'm going to call it friend. And you felt it on that. And then God said, go to girls Bible study. And you were going to go swimming. I don't know if that's a great temptation for some of you because some of y'all hate bathing suits. But you say yes, and you go to girls Bible study. And exactly what you were dealing with is exactly what was talked about. And you're like, what? I had a lady right in the middle of women's. She was like, this lady posted women's refresh on her Facebook. And I didn't even know the lady, but she met me at the door. And when I got here tonight, I thought, and this is her shouting out in front of all the women. She's because God totally changed my whole message. And I go, I don't even know why I'm teaching on this tonight. And then she jumps up and she goes, and she knows no one in the room. She was so excited. I'm telling you, it was wild. She goes, I know why you're teaching this tonight for me. And I was like, wow. Her name was Ashley. She goes, I didn't even know about this group, but this lady posted this on it. And I met her at the door and she goes, and I'm sitting here all night going, I think she slipped something in my bag that like transmitted to me. Cause I said I'd been decorating all day. And, and she's like, because everything that I talked about in the car with my friend tonight and her friend was sitting next to her crying. She goes, everything that I talked about with my friend tonight, everything that we talked about dinner tonight, when I couldn't have known, you talked like, and she said, and it wasn't just one thing, it was like 40. Wow! That's the Holy Ghost, first of all. That's not showing me off. That's showing him off. I had no idea. I don't know this lady, right? And she's going, you you said that whole thing for me, right? She, If she wouldn't have been there, she wouldn't have had exactly everything she needed. And then I, I gave a call for prayer. It wasn't a salvation prayer. It was, it was just, if you need anything, she comes to the front. I'm praying over her. She's bawling. God's touching her life. And she got exactly what she needed. But if she didn't say yes to that ding, and, and her, her carnal nature, her body, her flesh could have said, don't go. You don't know any of those women. Who's this weirdo? You don't even know the person posting this. And you're going to some place in some building, and you're going to walk in and know nobody? Not one soul. And then she probably listened to the ding and said, invite your friend. Because her friend was sitting next to her bawling. So her friend's sitting next to her. God's touching both of their life. They're getting it rocked for Jesus. And, and she gets like all the 40 things that she talked about, all the 40 questions, she got answers to every single one. 
That's a little yes. Right? And who knows, that moment in her life could have totally shifted her whole life and put her on the path for her purpose. I believe it did. Because I fed the women what I'm feeding, feeding you. For your purpose, for what you're called to do. These little tips, they're not little tips. These are what you do. You give them a yes to all the little ones. And you learn to hear them. So, so you texted that friend and you go, oh, that's what it felt like, right? And then, I don't know, you sign up for that class and you took it and you're like, man, I got my life in that class. And you're like, that was God. I said yes to it. You're learning how to hear him. Now, sometimes you might say yes and miss it. You're like, man, why did I come here tonight? Like, I love it. Tyler came up to me and he goes, this is going to be, that's the last unanointed fishing trip that I ever go on. Remember? You were so bummed because somebody was speaking that Sunday and you missed it and it was so good, right? And he's like, ah, I went fishing and I didn't even catch fish. That was a, a no. He needed to say no, but he said yes, right? Super tiny. Is God mad at Tyler for saying no? No. And not saying yes to staying home and going to church? Absolutely not. But in that moment, Tyler realized, well, that wasn't God. So the next time he gets that little nudge and he went fishing and he caught no fish, he's going to be like, I felt this last time. I felt this on the inside last time. I felt that little red light, don't go, something's for you at church on Sunday, right? Do you see what I'm saying? And he learns to recognize that nudge because last time he got no fish. So this time I'm saying yes to church. And then he comes to church and he's got the 40 things he needed answers to. Do you see what I'm saying? And then he goes, that was God. And you're learning to know what it feels like every time. And when you miss it, you go, oh, well, that's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> that's all, right? And then when it really matters, the big yes and no, when the Holy Spirit is giving you a red light on the inside and saying, don't go with the friends, you're going to know what it feels like. You're going to know what it senses like. And you're going to go, that felt this way when I did this and I didn't get any fish. That felt this way when I did this and this happened. So I'm definitely not saying yes. I don't know what's out there, but I'm not going to say yes to that. I'm going to hold up and I'm going to listen to God. And I'm going to give him my yes. Because you'll, you knew how to learn what it was when it was needed. And so that when it really counts, when it's your destiny, when it's your life, you'll recognize it. But you have to start saying the little yes. To things that don't really matter, but you're learning to hear his voice and you're stumbling and, hey, young one, you're going to miss it a few times. But you're going to start to learn how to recognize it on the inside. This is about... This is how you're like, man, Afton, I was hoping God would give me a burning bush that would talk to me like Moses to tell me what I'm supposed to do. I was hoping that a hand would appear on the wall and start writing on it. Is that Daniel? Many, many tekel parson. Is that Daniel? He doesn't do that. At least I've never heard of somebody hearing from a burning bush in this modern day, but I know that he put his spirit on the inside so we can hear him here right? And he, you can hear him. Say, I can hear him. You can hear him. So Afton, how do I get so able to hear him? You need to get so close to your heavenly father that your he is in you and you are in him and the two become one. you'll hear him like a bullhorn then. Does that make sense? Because you'll just naturally start taking steps that he wants you to take. The closer you are to Jesus, the more you've been watching him in his word, the more you've seen him act. It's like, first of all, first of all, you give him your yes. Second of all, you imitate him. Because like the disciples, they just did what he did. They just walked where he walked, Right? So it's like monkey see, monkey do. Imitate him. Read the Bible and act like him. Be like, Jesus did this, I'm going to do this, right? Imitate him. 
act like him. And then the, the other part to that is let him fill you with his spirit and spend time in his presence and let him fill you so that you two can merge. You know what I mean? Like a marriage. You become one. And you'll hear him so clearly in that place, walking with him. You'll hear him so clearly. It'll just be like natural, right? I feel like it was more natural for the one girl than it was for the other three. Why? Something about her walk with him must have been closer, right? Because I know the Holy Spirit was talking to all of them. God's wills, none of them should perish. Jesus made it super clear. He said, there's only, was it Jesus? There's only one, who, yeah, there's only one who came to steal, to kill, or to destroy. And Jesus said, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly or, or life overflowing. I've come that you have amazing life, Right? An overflowing life is an awesome life. Jesus doesn't want you to have this unadventurous, sad life. He came for you to have a great life. And there's only one who came to steal, kill, and to destroy. And he specifically says that. And he says, that's the devil. Anything that steals from you, kills you, or destroys from you, you is him. And so we know his will for us is life and life more abundantly. We don't have to wonder if God wants us to live, right? So God is speaking to those other kids saying, don't get in that car. Don't go to that game. But there's one in there in that bunch that's so close to him, walks with him, spends time in his word, and she's given him a million little yeses in her lifetime. So when the big one came, she gave him that yes. I'll stay home. When she probably really wanted to go, right? It's the same thing for your purpose. It's the same thing for your call. I'm training you how to hear him. That's how you hear him. You gotta wake up in the morning and you gotta answer the phone call. You have to say, I'm laying down my life this morning as a living sacrifice. I'm yours. And then... Watch what he does and imitate him. Pick up your Bible, read in his word, but I don't know where to go, Afton. Start with Jesus. Read about him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you're done with that, when you're done with that, you could decide two places. I would go to the book of Ephesians and learn all about the Holy Spirit and how he lives on the inside of me and how he speaks to me and strengthens me and empowers me. Then I would go read what people can do when the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of them. And I'd go to the book of Acts. Awesome stories in Acts. Adventures of a lifetime, right? And then as you're walking this Christian walk, things can get hard. So then I'd read the letters to the churches. That's all the epistles. And you can literally read those anytime. You know what you could do also? Read Proverbs. There's one for every day of the month. One proverb for every day. Read a Psalms. Psalms are beautiful. Psalms, and, and I would read a Psalms and a proverb every day, and then I'd still read about Jesus. And then I'd still go to the Holy Spirit in me, and I'd still read the epistles, the letters to the churches, because they help answer real-life, everyday Christian problems. How do I walk this walk, God? Read a letter to somebody in the church. Paul wrote to the Corinthians. He wrote to Galatians. Those are the ones that struggle with religiousness and they feel condemned all the time and they have to be perfect. If you're feeling that way, read Galatians. Read it 50 times if you need to. Galatians. Because Paul says, hey, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? Why are you still trying to obey the law perfectly to earn your salvation when Jesus died to give it to you? It's free, right? So if you have a problem with condemnation, read Galatians. Read the letters, right? And when you're ready, read Revelations. That's the revealing of Jesus Christ. That's why it's called Re Revelations. It reveals him. That's not a scary book. That's an amazing book. But I would, I would live in the letters to the churches. You don't know what to read? Go open Corinthians. There's going to be something good in there. You don't know what to read? Read Thessalonians. There's going to be something good in there. Does that make sense? How many of you guys? 
are ready to answer the call. And what I mean with answer the call is not, you've already given your life to Christ. You have. But every day I'm going to answer that call. I'm going to pick it up. Right? How you guys are ready for that? I'm going to give him my yes in every moment. My little yeses matter. Right? I'm going to start to learn how to hear him and answer with the yes. And when I miss it, it's okay. Right? Because I'm learning to follow him. Right? I'm just learning to follow him. And every day, it's going to be better and better and better. Every day. Does that make sense? Well, the